Good, Steve? Awesome. And my, uh, my next little sore this morning, I, I always go to the gym on uh, Sunday mornings. I get up early, I'll go there, and it helps me get my mind right. Some of the best times I have with the Lord are when I'm at the gym for whatever reason. It's one of those things. You talk to some people, and it's their morning coffee. It's kind of that place they encounter God. It's whatever it may be. It's in your car on the way to work. For me, it's in the gym lifting weights in front of total strangers who are seeing me have a conversation with myself out loud. But that's the way it works. And as I'm there this morning, I was uh, a little distracted, and I tweaked my neck. And at first, it just felt a little uncomfortable. Then it became borderline paralyzing. And as I'm hunched over like this, I'm trying to get out of there. And they had one of these full-body massage chairs. So I thought, well, you know what? I'm done a little early. I might as well sit down. It said 15 minutes. But unbeknownst to me, 15 minutes, according to this machine, is not real-time 15 minutes. It's more like 35 minutes. So I sit there and I press start and it reclines me back to a position where I can't actually sit up now because my neck hurts. I'm thinking, good thing it's only 15 minutes. And five minutes went by and 10 minutes and 15 and 20 and 25. And I'm thinking, I got to go to church. I got to go set up and I'm trying to get, I'm trying to lift my head and I'm just, I can't quite reach the power button which will automatically put me back in the proper position to get out of this chair. And I'm straining and I'm praying like, oh Lord Jesus, you know, to help me. And as people would walk by, I had this thought of, I could ask this stranger for help who would completely judge me right off the bat. Or I could really listen to my pride and say nothing and just wait it out because this can't go on forever. Well, I chose the latter, so I mean, eventually the machine shut off and I sat up and I got here. But... (laughs) Funny things like that to kind of start off your day. Um, Yeah, we're celebrating Thanksgiving. You know, and I know that I have a lot to be thankful for as well. I'm so thankful and grateful for a God who loves me. You know, and as you compare your story being a disciple of Christ to people outside this faith, you know, people who might subscribe to legalism, in the Christian faith, or people who might subscribe to a different form of religion and belief system altogether. And you start comparing their interactions with this idea of God and ours, we have a lot to be thankful for. Jesus is the only deity in any form of religion or belief system that comes down as one of us to lift us up and do what we cannot do for ourselves. Everything else is works-based. If you're good enough, if you do enough, you maybe, possibly, someday, might have a chance at being accepted by God. Maybe. Which pushes you to do very different and extreme things. Not motivated out of love for one another, but out of fear and hate. We have a lot to be thankful for. I have a healthy, loving family. I have a lot to be thankful for. I have a church community that believes in grace, that is studying under a deeper understanding of what grace is, how vast it is, how powerful it is, how life-transforming it is, and I'm learning each and every week myself. I'm blessed with a church community that lifts each other up in prayer, including me. I'm thankful. I really hope that you are too. You know, because the more I look around, the more I realize that life right now is just drenched with parody. It's probably the only way to put it. I mean, from the simplest and most insignificant of things to the greatest things. You cannot predict what will come next. You cannot predict or change how something is going to happen perfectly to all the detailed degree that you would like. I mean, being an NHL fan, let's just stop there for a second, because I'm assuming I'm not the only one in this room, because I know Steve is. In two games in the NHL starting this year, we have seen so much parity where the defending Stanley Cup champions, who have won two years in a row, get blown out 10 to 1 in their own building. I, that doesn't happen. That's strange. Or Alexander Ovechkin, one of the greatest Russian players of all time, who was on the trading block at the end of last year because he wasn't earning his keep, scores seven goals by himself in two games. These are the types of things that make me excited about hockey. But sometimes when you look at that type of parody in life, it's not as easy, is it? I could not predict that I would grow up in a place where I would be blessed and loved and be able to express my faith and experience my faith publicly, openly. 
I could not predict that there would be a God who loved me so much that even before I was born, He sent Himself down to live life for me, to die for me, to resurrect and share in that new life with me. I couldn't tell these things. Nor could I predict that this last week in Vegas, one of the horrific things that we saw and witnessed were a man that just seemingly snapped and had no reason that whatsoever would open fire on unsuspecting people, killing almost 60. And it seems that week after week, day after day, that parody continues because there's a lot of people out there that do horrific things and it seems to define and shape and hinder our world as we go forward. But I also cannot fathom or understand or comprehend or predict how Jesus is going to work amidst horror and pain and suffering. Because there's stories coming out, even of the Vegas shooting where you see people and you're overwhelmed by this horrific death story that just keeps getting blasted in your face for short periods of time. And it's more about the emotional reaction than the actual stories of people. Because that's how news works. It sells, okay? If you get an emotional reaction, then somebody's hooked. But when you start listening to the stories of people and how many lives were saved by the selflessness of others, shielding them with their own bodies, throwing them over the walls so they could get to safety when they could not do for themselves, hearing the testimonies of people saying, I found Jesus in that moment. Because that's not just one story. That's several stories that are coming out in the newspaper. So how many stories aren't being told or being heard where Jesus shows up at the midst horror and he encounters people? That's our God. And I realize that this morning, and I realize that, and I try and realize that every day, that's what we have to be thankful for. We have so much. We truly are blessed. See, Jesus said, love your enemies. Now, it's kind of a tough concept when you start looking at it in big picture situations, because maybe you can put yourself in a situation in your mind where you say, you know, this person's been really nasty to me, or this person did such horrific things, I couldn't actually love that person. I need to let Jesus be Jesus. It's not an easy thing. I think too often when when people say, oh, love your enemies, you know, live and let live. Ah, yeah, okay, thanks, Paul McCartney. Or live and let die, I suppose is his saying, but, you know, it's, it's not something that's easy. It's not something that's natural in human nature. See, an enemy is someone who does you harm. It's not someone who is an actual nemesis that maybe causes physical harm. It may be someone that you know and someone that you should care about via the relationship who tears you down with their words. Intentionally tries to make you feel small. Wants to see you fail. I, I could list off story after story of other people who I know who have people like this in their life and they're so burdened by the pain and the suffering that's caused to them they couldn't possibly comprehend to love this person. See, grace and love are given freely. Not deserved, not earned, not merited. And it's given to those broken and sinful and not perfect people. And you know who is included in that is us. I'm thankful that I am. I'm thankful that we are. Not because we deserve it, but because we need it. And because we're loved and valued. I mean, when you talk about a God who is so beyond our comprehension and what he does and his grace and his love, that again, I don't think we'll ever fully grasp its full measure this side of eternity. But it's something that is experiential. It's something that can grip and change your life. But it doesn't just stop at the doors of the church. It goes out to our enemies, to the broken, to the sinful, because we're all that without Christ. Mark chapter 2, I think, sums that up, and it basically is talking about the grace of Jesus and the love of Christ, not just meant for the good people. Because Christ himself said, who is good except for my Father? Mark 2, verse 14. As he passed by, this is Jesus, he saw Levi, who was Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. 
let's just pause there for a second, because again, the, the culture of the day, the only way a rabbi or teacher, Jesus, would actually receive a disciple to come and follow and be like him is if you were the best of the best, you, you go through this educational process and it weeds out everyone who's not good enough by the standards that have been set. And then you could apply to a rabbi and if they accepted your application, then you would be received. Matthew's sitting in a tax booth. He isn't sitting at this graduation ceremony where he's, yes, I've now been validated enough to be a disciple of a teacher. He's doing a very different chore, a very different job. And the culture of the day dictates this is not the way it's done. And in fact, if you were a tax collector, you'd be reviled by your culture. Okay? And I'll tell you why. You would have reviled... Matthew, being a Jewish man, would have been reviled by all the Jews of Jesus' day because of their perceived greed and collaboration with the Roman occupiers. So Rome has conquered the known world, and one of the ways they kept you dependent upon them is they would suck out the resources like finances. You were supplying and powering this gigantic empire with your money. And instead of having their own Roman soldiers there to start sucking that money from you, they would hire local people of their own culture. So they were hiring Jewish people to say, listen, I've got an idea for you. I know you hate us as Romans and that we actually own you right now, but what I will do for you is if you collect and bring all the money that Rome wants, why don't you take a little bit extra for yourself? It starts to play into the human greed and they would do it. I mean, a lot of times, that, that's good business, man. If I can actually get ahead in a time where economically I might not be doing so good otherwise, this is an opportunity that's been given to me. And I can do it by leeching off my own people and giving to the higher power, which already owns me. So Matthew was hated. He's one of the most hated people in society because he's rich, and he's getting rich off the backs of all the oppressed people that he has turned his backs to. Okay? And here's Jesus saying, that man there, the most hated man, the most hated... I can't find the word. His occupation, there it is. I want him. I want him to come and follow me. And again, that, that, that's Jesus, bringing people out of a state of life, out of a state of existence that may be hated by others because of the damage they've done. He says, no, no, I've got something more for you. Come and follow me. And Matthew does. He gets up and he follows him. To put this into a different context, in World War II, you had the ghetto soldiers that would put all the Jewish people onto these train cars and pack them in tighter than animals in unlivable situations, and then they would be shipped off to a concentration camp to eventually be executed. The people that were pushing you onto those train cars were your own people a lot of times, that the Germans would hire these Jewish soldiers. And they would give them a title. They would give them a little bit better treatment than the rest of them were getting shipped off to die. And in the hopes that you could save your own skin, you would betray your own people, push them on, and become traitors, become hated. It's like Jesus going in that situation saying, I want you to come and follow me. This is setting up for an illustration that's going to come and it's going to follow is that Jesus doesn't just pick the good people, right? And I say that with quotations because we're not. Apart from Christ in us, I don't think we can do anything good. Right? And it's the work of Christ. But the fact that Jesus sees value and he has love for people outside of these perfect conditions. He doesn't just go by society's standards. Neither can we afford to as the church. Verse 15 says, And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many of them, and they were following him. See, all of a sudden, now you've got a ton of people having fellowship with Jesus, who have identified themselves now with Jesus because they're following him. Something, is, something has happened. Something is changing. Their paths, their destinies are being altered at this moment. And when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors... Now, again, it's not just like this, this, this specific general group of sinners. It's sinners and tax collectors. They hate these people so much they have to specify. It's like, 
a lot of times it's like, oh, you've got the normal sinners, and then you've got the sexual sinners, right? Like, if you want to bring it into a church context nowadays, most churches are most uncomfortable with any sort of sin that has to do with sexuality, because it's, you know, they get the skin crawls for whatever reason. It's like, okay, we've got normal sin, and then we've got your sin, <laughs> Right? Right? A lot of times, it's the language that people use. It's the language they hear. That's what they're trying to identify others with. And that's what's happening here. These, these scribes and the Pharisees are like, Dude, you seem okay, Jesus. I'm not really made up my mind on you yet. You're different. You don't do things the way we'd like. But I see you've got a bunch of sinners and tax collectors. What the insert word here are you thinking? Right? Like, this is the type of attitude they're approaching us with. They're completely baffled as to why Jesus would make such an atrocious, obvious mistake that he'd be sitting and having a meal with these people. The sinners and the tax collectors. And then they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, this is what I love about Jesus, because apparently his... His God abilities don't just translate from the heart, like we talked about last week, being able to hear the thoughts inside. But his ears are almost supernatural hearing as well. And hearing this, Jesus said to them, Is it not those who are healthy who need a physician? But it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. I didn't come to call the righteous people. I came for the sinners. Let me, let me put it this way. If you're a fisherman, you don't throw your net in water that has been polluted for years and pick up all the diseased fish. You're not seeking after the least quality. When you go and buy meat at the store, you don't look for the meat that's past its expiry date by two weeks and has completely changed color to take home and cook. You don't buy the old produce that has turned brown and withered and is bent and rubbery. And if you do, tax collector level, no, I'm kidding. (laughs) But here's Jesus, and he's saying, you know what, I want the least of these. Give me your trash. The ones you've rejected, the ones you can't stand, the ones you you think have no value, I want them. And you know why? Because God wants them. And for whatever reason, your head knowledge hasn't allowed your heart to experience that. Give them to me. I want them. I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I didn't want to call the righteous. I want to call the sinners. I don't want the self-righteous. I want the ones that I will make righteous, that my righteousness will be displayed in them and through them. I want the broken. Give me the sick. It ties in with this whole idea of love your enemies because guess what? Even though they may be doing horrific things to you and unworthy of grace, so are we. But we still love Jesus and Jesus wants them. And if we start looking at people that way, that Jesus wants them, and we start looking at life that way, that Jesus wants all, it starts changing the way that we think towards others and the way that we act and treat towards other people too, right? Bono from U2 said, sinners make the best saints. And he was right. I remember when he said that quote years ago, it came out in a Johnny Cash video right after Johnny Cash died. And it was his version of God's going to cut you down. And this music video had all these different uh, pop culture musicians that were big at the time, and some of them still are. And they were in this video, and they're singing this song. And it's almost like a tribute to Johnny Cash, but unintentionally almost a tribute to God. And there's Bono. And he's got this spray paint, and he spray paints on this wall or this couch. I can't remember. Sinners make the best saints. His .5 seconds of his FaceTime, and he he wanted to point it towards God. They said, do something. He said, cool. Sinners make the best saints. And he got so much flack from the church. And he got so much, like, like, what are you saying? Like, we can't just have anyone coming in here. Like, Bono, do you? And, like, even his pastor at the time was saying, well, we can't just be having people come into our church. And Bono said, well, why? And Bono pointed to this. He said, Jesus didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. He didn't come for the self-righteous. He came for the sinners. Sinners make the best saints because they are made from sinners into saints by Christ. It has nothing to do with what we're capable of or what we do. It's all about Jesus. Why? Why did Jesus come for the broken? especially since it's not a part of the original design plan. 
Why does he care? Why does he love his creation so much? Something he's actually made. So much that I need to save it. I need to fix it. They're drowning. They're ill. They need me. I don't think we can actually fully answer or understand love when Jesus says, I love you. I don't think we can. Because his love has no boundaries, no limits. But there's a need met by that love. By the one who can. For a people who can't themselves. For people in need. That's us. That's me. That's our enemies. That's the broken people around the planet. That's for everybody. See, the bad perception uh, in a post-saved world, I find, is that a lot of times when people get saved, they come to Christ for a while. I don't know where this comes in. I think it's just a part of the human narrative, that we are not perfect, but Christ is perfect and he's in us. And, and I don't understand fully the balance of how that works, except for the fact that we are promised that he washes our sins away that he becomes all that I am not, that he comes into me and, and just fills the void of what I was created to be, but I, I can't be on my own apart from him. And he comes in and he does this amazing work. And he starts to work on my character and my desires, my passions, and who I am. Not as in, you need to fall into this category by checking off these do and don't boxes, but because of, I'm working on who you are at your very core things start to fade away. But a lot of times, people can fall into this category of, I'm, I'm better than now, because I've been set apart. It, and it's funny, when you talk to some people who fall under this legalistic idea, they'll say, they might even have this unintentional idea of, I'm better than everyone else outside of Christ, because he did a work in me. They might even vocalize that. But what they're missing is at that point is, listen, Jesus did it for you. You didn't do it yourself, so you're not better than. Because if we start having this concept of, of us and them, we got the church and we got everybody else, it can set up these unintentional barriers and it starts to define people differently because we got us, our family, saved by grace, hallelujah, amen, and then we got the sinners and the tax collectors out there. See, the Pharisees and the scribes saw these people a certain way and what Jesus didn't want is for any of the people that he was working on, his sinners, his tax collectors that were following him, to pick up this type of mentality that was being put against them as well. By saying, oh, well, we're better than now. You may hate us, but we're going to hate you back because you're our enemy. And we've been saved by Jesus Christ. And so now we're walking with the big dog. What are you going to do? You've got nothing on us. Jesus doesn't want that. We're not battling against other sinners. We're battling against the enemy. And the enemy is not flesh and blood. Jesus didn't separate us from them. He's bringing us into his fold. We're blessed, we're thankful, we're grateful. Now go out and make disciples of all nations. It's not about self-righteousness. It's about the righteousness that comes to the sinners through Jesus Christ. I read this story this week and I thought I'd share it with you. There was a man in the Middle East named Mohammed. Go figure. No? Aha! There's only about three million of them over there. He was a high-ranking ISIS leader. And after watching Leading the Way satellite TV channel, he had a plan. He was going to kill a member of one of their follow-up team. Mohammed called the number on the screen. I need to meet with you, he told Peter, one of the Leading the Way follow-up team leaders. For security purposes, their policy about vetting callers was enforced before meeting with the person personally. But a follow-up team leader, Peter, discerned God's voice urging him, this time it's different. Go and meet with this man alone and be bold with him. See, what Peter didn't know at this time is that this guy is wanting to just throw out the bait so he can have someone come to him and kill him. That was his plan. Peter doesn't know this, but God says, and I want you to go to this guy and be bold. Be bold bold. That was his key. I need you to tell him the truth. I need you to tell it to him like it is. I don't want you to put on kid gloves. You need to be direct and stern with this guy. And he did. After they parted ways, meaning that something didn't happen that was planned, which was the murder of Peter, 
God continued to speak to Muhammad, revealing himself in a dream and bringing great conviction upon him. And he met with Peter again. He said, Peter, I have a confession. The first time we met, I intended to kill you, and, and I'm sorry. And he fell on his face. And he repented before Christ. And this former ISIS leader is now our brother in Christ. His conversion happened just weeks ago. And by God's mercy and grace, has been baptized and is already serving Christ where he lives. While Christian outreach is difficult and dangerous in many parts of the world, and even here now a little bit too, and it's restricted, especially in the Middle East, some Muslims have powerful encounters with Jesus through dreams, visions, and even personal visitations. And at the end of this article, there was an interesting stat that said from 1960 to 2010, the number of Muslims that have converted to faith in Jesus has grown from fewer than 200,000 to some 10 million people. And that's not because we're that good. That's because God is that faithful. And the reason I bring up this type of comparison is a lot of times I hear come out of people's mouths in today's day and age is us and them type language against people from the Middle East, especially, heaven forbid, if they're Muslim in their faith. And by definition, which doesn't really make sense, as Derwin and I have talked about a lot of times. Oh, don't, if they're Islamic, Lord help them. I can't tell you how many Christians I've talked to. Because you know why? Our media is really geared that way. Ah, oh, Islamic terrorists. Does Jesus love Muslim people? Yeah. Does Jesus love ISIS killing machines that hate Christ and hate Christians? Yes. Does Jesus love people like Stephen who went out in a shooting spree in Las Vegas? Yeah. How hard is that to hear? How hard is that to take? And when Jesus says, not only do I love them, but I want you to love them like I have, and I want you to allow me to work in you to enable you to do that, I want you to love your enemies. Enemy is not in the sense of this forever term. Enemy is not in the sense of you've got sinners and saints and we're on the right side of things and we're going to win the war because the war's already been won. Jesus just wants more people on his side before the war ends. An opportunity, an extension of love and grace by him saying, listen, I want you to be my hands, my feet. I've got a purpose for you. I want you to love these people that are unlovable, that are rejected by the world, that the people that the world sees as unsavable, unlovable, unforgivable. I want those people in my fold. Will you be a part of that with me? I'll tell you what, in my own accord, I can't. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people that I just can't stand, that have hurt me, that have destroyed me, and have done it intentionally, have done it very, very well. And Jesus is saying, okay, how are you going to respond? I'm like, with a closed fist. He says, well, well, hold up a sec. That might feel good for little while, if I'm being honest. Sometimes I just love to deck people. Oh, just love to give them a bony five and a snot locker. Just, just to drop them and f- hear that sound. of the... Anyway. And then the Lord kind of kicks in. He says, well, that's an option. I wouldn't suggest it. I don't think it's the right option. I think you know that. How are you going to love these people? I can't. I know you can't. You're going to let me love you. Let me love through you? What does that look like? Let me show you. And there's been times where instantaneously, and I'm not going to say it's going to be that all the time for everybody, but for whatever reason, God saw it fit in that moment to say, let me love through you. And it started with a sense of peace. And I actually felt such a loving, compelling force within me that I sought after this person's validation and what they were saying, even though it was complete fabrication against me and my character and my family. And I said, I want to hear you in that. And I love you. And if there's anything I've done unintentionally that has made you feel uncomfortable, I want to own that and apologize. I want to validate you. This person said, well, I don't want your apology. He said, no, no, I need to because I love you. And as I said these words, I'm hearing it come out of my mouth. I'm like, what is happening? But it was this something from deep within me that was compelling me to be able to do this that was completely apart from me as well. There's a website from The God Reporters that says, 
has featured numerous accounts of Jesus making appearances in the Middle East in places that are unchurched, that are seemingly unreachable. And these people have their stories they're sharing, and some of them are as follows. Jesus appearing to a Muslim family in the refugee camps. Jesus appearing on a boat of Muslim refugees crossing stormy Aegean Sea. A vision of Jesus that stopped an Islamic fighter attempting to kill a Christian pastor. Jesus appearing to bedridden Muslim mother. And a descendant of Muhammad finding Jesus through a dream. Jesus came for the sinners, which is everyone. And the way that he does things is just so amazing. And the fact that his method of showing himself his true self, and drawing people in that we just can't seem to reach, and we're just like, God, they're beyond. It's, it's us and them. I can't do it. I can't love them. They're too far gone. They're too far destroyed. They're too far broken. They're too much of a sinner. I can't be bothered. Whatever it may be, Jesus says, oh, I'm going to do it. Love your enemies. I did not come for the healthy. I came for the sick. So who in your life do you see as an enemy? Who, who have you set boundaries between me and them? Who have we made less than us and labeled and defined because of their past, because of the pain they've caused? And how are you going to ask Christ how you will love them from this day forward? For other people, Jesus sees the broken and sinful and doesn't reject them. Neither can we afford to. And for ourselves, we can regret poor decisions, intentional poor decisions, stupid intentional poor decisions in some of my cases. <laughs> but because of the blood of Christ, we no longer have to feel shame. He doesn't define us by our sins. Only we do. So Lord, right now I just thank you for so much of your love and your grace and your giftings that you bestow upon us each and every day, Lord. I thank you that you did not come for the healthy. You did not come for the best of the best. You came for all people. Lord, you came for the brokenness. You came for the sinners. Lord, I thank you that you are the physician that works on us, body, mind, and soul. I thank you that your love is not limited, that there's no checklist that we need to meet, Lord God. I thank you that your grace is so life-transforming. Lord, that you receive us, that you forgive us, that you love us. And it has nothing to do with what we've done to earn it. Lord, and that you offer it as a free gift. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for the work that you do in our lives, Lord God, on an individual level on a communal body level as well, Lord Jesus, that we can just see you at work and refining our characters, Lord God, and our passions, giving us new eyes to see people as no longer less than or different from or separate from, but as people who need you. Lord, help us see people through the lenses of love. Lord, in ways that we cannot do on our own. Help us to reach out and love our enemies, Lord God, and love people that maybe the world has labeled as enemies. Lord Jesus, let us see people and not define them as sinners or tax collectors. Let us see people as your creation who either already know you or haven't yet met the one who loves Lord God, and reveal to us in different ways in your timing in accordance with your will of if you want us to do certain things in a different way and how you want those ways to be done and to look, especially as we reach out and we desire to see each and every broken and sinful person's life who needs the physician to save their souls. Lord God, help us to willingly reach out and say, Lord, here are we. Send us as you see fit. Lord, again, I thank you for this place. I thank you for the things I learn. 
the journey that we are all on together, Lord God, and I pray that you'll just unleash your spirit upon this body. Lord, and let us love radically. Lord, and let us be uncommon in our practice so we will not be a predictable stereotype, Lord God, but we will be motivated by the Spirit of God who is unpredictable, uncontainable, undefinable. Let us be a people on mission to see sinners become saints by the work and the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Tiffany and come.